The Prix Galleon is a welcome initiative to stimulate creative research and promote excellence. Barack Obama. The Galleon Awards Ceremony is considered the equivalent of the Oscars night for the innovators in the labs and awards every year the best pharmaceutical product, the best biotechnology product, the best medical technology, best digital health, best incubator accelerator, best startup. This is the right event on the right issue at the right time. I thank His Excellency the President for bringing Prix Galleon to Africa and I look forward to the day when we will celebrate an African winner of the Prix Galleon. I'm particularly grateful to receive this award. The awards are among the highest honors in science and commerce because they lead to improvement in the human condition. The Pre Galleon Awards recognize the world's brightest minds and most innovative companies. They are a true celebration of the hard work required to produce life-changing interventions. That is what makes us optimistic about the future. Congratulations to all of you. Make a difference. Join the Galleon Foundation. Welcome to the Galleon Foundation Week of Innovation webinars here in New York. The objective this week is to provide additional content and background for our largest annual event, the Pre-Galleon USA Awards, to be held this Thursday here in New York. We have developed this webinar series to give our nominees for Best Pharmaceutical, Best Biotech, Best MedTech, Best Digital Health Product, Best Startup, and Best Incubator Accelerator category, greater visibility in describing their journey of medical discovery. It is especially timely as the Galleon Foundation marks its 50th Golden Jubilee year, represented by our Golden Jubilee Forum and Gala Awards Center on Thursday, October 27. This year's Pre Galleon USA Awards has a record 140, 147 nominees for our six categories from 126 companies covering 15 diverse therapeutic areas, ranging from cancer, cardiology, and neurosciences to infectious and very rare genetic diseases and vaccines. We'll be looking closely at all of these areas throughout the week. In the best med tech category, which is our focus today, we'll be holding three webinars due to the large number of products, 24 total, representing this important field. This webinar and the hour that we have allotted is devoted to the nominees in medical devices and implants, other therapeutic areas. What we will cover today relates to this central question. What is med tech innovation doing for patients with highly specialized needs for treatment? We will allot some time for audience questions, so please forward your questions to me using the link provided on your screen. Okay, let's get going. I'll start by introducing each nominated product's scientific clinical representative who is joining this webcast. Please welcome Rob Scott, Vice President, Intraocular Devices R&D of Alcon, and the product being nominated is Acrosoft IQ Vividity Extended Vision Intraocular Lens, Rob Kissling, Vice President, Medical and Scientific Affairs, Bausch & Lomb, and the nominated product is Xperia. John Huckman, Chief Technology and Development Officer of Impel Pharmaceuticals, and the nominated product is Trudisa. Cynthia Silva, Medical Officer, and their nominated product is Tableau Hemodialysis System. And finally, Adam Dunkey Jacobs, Chief Technology Officer and Chief Operating Officer of Standard Bariatrics, and their nominated product is Titan SGS. And for the audience, there is an accessible link to a 100 word statement submitted by the companies on behalf of each of the nominated products. And this link will be available for viewing during the webcast. Okay, so we'll start by asking our panelists some questions about their product's journey. Panelists, if you will begin with a brief overview of your product before answering the question, that will be very helpful. Okay, so let's start with Rob Scott. 
Rob, why did your company choose to focus on the disease state and indication associated with a product? And how significant was the level of unmet medical need? Hi, Catherine. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, let me actually start by uh, kind of going through the unmet need and its significance, and then I'll kind of build to a description of uh, Vividi um, and the technology and the innovation. And of course, the lights went out in my room. Right, is There we go. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, first of all, I, I'd point out that Alcon is the global leader in eye care. Our mission is to help people see um, brilliantly. Uh, therefore, all of our innovation efforts, all of our technology pursuits are focused on a diversity of conditions in ophthalmology, um, including but not limited to cataract. For information, cataract is the leading cause of vision loss globally. Um, there are 28 million cataract surgeries performed globally per year, um, and that number will be 5.4 million cataract surgeries per year in the U.S. alone by 2025. Just by way of background, um, cataract, if, if you don't know, is cloudiness of the eye's natural lens, um, usually occurring with age. Um, cataract surgery entails the removal of the cloudy natural lens and its replacement by an artificial lens implant, an intraocular lens or IOL. Very, very importantly, um, the moment of cataract surgery also presents the opportunity not only to solve the cataract and restore good distance vision, but also the opportunity to provide the patient the benefit of some level of independence from eyeglasses. That means lessening the patient's need for glasses, not only for distance vision, but also for intermediate and near vision. Um, however, there are a meaningful number of patients, um, and this is the unmet need, uh, for whom the most prominent presbyopia correcting technology called diffractive optics may not be an optimal choice. Diffractive optics fundamentally work by splitting the light that enters the eye. Some, but not all of the light is used for distance vision, um, and other um, parts of the light are used for intermediate and or near vision. So it's well known that diffractive optics can give very good outcomes with respect to spectacle independence for many patients, but actually two to three out of 10 patients may be disqualified from this technology due to non-suitability of a light splitting technology based on their individual eye health and other factors. Um, some patients may also experience bothersome side effects called visual disturbances with some diffractive IOLs. So that leads us to um, Vividi, which is the first and only non-diffractive presbyopia miti mitigating technology with exceptional clarity. Vividi employs a novel and innovative optical designs, design which extends what's known as a depth of focus, again, very importantly, without splitting light. The technology is patented. Um, it's called X-Wave technology. Um, and what we've done is we've actually introduced two smooth micron scale surface features in the very central part of the IOL optic. These features modulate and control the phase of the incoming optical wavefront with the result of stretching and shifting the wavefront to create an extended focal range. It's this stretching and shifting effect that differentiates the vividity mechanism of action from that of other technologies which split light. So what does all of that add up to? Um, first and most importantly, um, patients receiving the Vividi lens get monofocal quality or very high quality distance vision, and they get that high quality distance vision with excellent intermediate vision and functional near vision. Um, low levels of patient reported visual disturbances are, are, are seen, and ultimately, um, what all of this means is that Vividi technology has extended the reach of presbyopia correcting technology to an even broader population of patients. Wow, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, Rob Kissling, same question for you. Why did your company choose to focus on the disease state and indication associated with the product? And, and how significant was the level of unmet medical need? So, so really, there are, there are two innovations here in, in this product, and I'll, and I'll explain what it is. But first is, there was the condition uveitis, which is swelling of the or inflammation of the eye that has led to macular edema, which is swelling of the retina. And that causes distorted vision and it's completely sight threatening. So there's, there's the immediate unmet need uh, within uveitis, uh, but also there's a much larger need in the ability to deliver certain types of therapies into the eye in a better way. And so the way this, this product has worked, Zypir, uh, Zypir uses a triamcinolone injection and currently, so, so currently uveitis, I'll, I'll back up. So, so uveitis, as I mentioned, is an inflammation of the eyeball and <laughs> It, it, in some circumstances, leads to swelling of the retina itself. That's the, the photosensitive area of the eye. It, can, it transmits the light image 
to a neural image into the brain. So if you can imagine, if you get swelling in this area, the vision gets distorted. And, and then after a while, that swelling can, can lead to retinal cell loss. Um, so it's a, it's a site threatening condition there, there are current therapies that do now work for it. Uh, steroids are injected into the, the vitreous cavity, the central cavity of the eye, and they do treat uh, uveitis this way. Um, there are some limitations to that though, by virtue of how those injections are put into the eye and where they go, there's some pretty significant side effects that go with it. Likewise, when you look at other pharmaceuticals and other therapies, there, there are limitations to what can be put into the eye this way. So really this, this innovation is, is a stepwise uh, approach in two ways. The, the first being, so, so the way this works is, rather than deliver the triencinolone to the central cavity of the eye, where it can be, where, where many different types of tissues become exposed to the, the medicine and this causes side effects, um, this actually delivers medicine in between the layers of the wall. If you think of, if you think of the eye as a tennis ball that's hollow, it actually will deliver medicine between the layers of the rubber. So you can actually target more precisely the tissues that need a therapy. So, so number one, we've, we've shown this to be very effective uh, for treating uveitis and the macular edema associated with uveitis. And, and the idea being that this is, this is a step for <laughs> uveitis associated with macular edema as well. And so, so not only, not only this, where, where you have a stepwise, but really, if you look at innovation, innovation is often a stepwise process. And probably the bigger and more significant piece here is it was the first of its kind to deliver drugs this way. And it opens the gate for other new pharmaceuticals, other new therapies to be, to be delivered to the eye this way, including gene therapies. So, so it is, it is a, it is a win for uveitis in that it, the way that this is delivered improves the risk benefit profile of the medicines being delivered, but it, it also opens the door to deliver other drugs, other drugs which may have been uh, limited by how they would interact with these other ocular tissues. Um, they, they can now be delivered to the eye this way, and it's opened up a whole new potential of what you might use to treat conditions in the eye. That's great. So Rob Kissling and Rob Scott, both of you have made significant advancements in um, ophthalmology. So great news for patients who have these needs. Um, thank you very much for that important work. John, we have a different question for you. Um, is there a measurable impact that you can cite on clinical outcomes for patients with your product? And what's been the clinician and patient response to the product so far? And again, if you can begin with a brief product overview. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Um, so as an overview of the product, what Impel Pharmaceuticals has focused on is improving nasal drug delivery. Uh, so that's delivery of drugs into the nasal cavity. And what we focused on is central nervous system disorders. But trying to improve this technology, which um, if you think about traditional nasal spray devices, something you would see at a Rite Aid or a, a CVS to, you know, maybe use for rhinitis or, or local allergies. Uh, that technology has been around for about a hundred years. And it really hasn't been improved upon because most people think of the nasal cavity as somewhere where you can put things uh, for, for local inflammation or, or allergies. But what it, what it actually represents is another way to get drugs into the body when uh, things like swallowing a pill or injection are not optimal. So we developed what we call the pod technology, which is a simple non-invasive way for patients to self-administer some medications. And our focus has been on drugs where you would have to go into the emergency room typically or into a hospital setting to get those, but we can allow the patients to have the freedom to use those at home. Uh, our product, Trudessa, is a good example of that. It's a migraine medication um, for acute use. So if you have a migraine that has come on, you wake up with a migraine. Uh, this is a product, a uh, drug device combination product of dihydroergotamine with our pod technology, where patients can get uh, reproducible access and rapid access to this medication to hopefully clear up their migraine, uh, where previously they would either try a pill, which might take an hour to come on. If you use it in the morning, it might not work at all. 
uh, and especially for patients that don't respond to current migraine medication. They can use our product, Trudessa, and uh, hopefully not have this day-long, two-day-long migraine that would just sink their entire uh, day, not be able to go to work, not be able to take care of their kids, um, and in some cases end up in the emergency room. Um, to your question about uh, measurable responses, one of the reasons we picked uh, dihydroergotamine as our lead product uh, to push forward with our technology is that it is a very long lasting medication and it works for a lot of people that don't respond to other medications. Most people uh, who haven't experienced migraines or haven't had family member with migraines don't realize that although there are treatments for migraine, uh, it's one of the most debilitate, debilitating conditions in the United States and worldwide. And for most of the medications that are out there, only about a third of people respond uh, and, and can clear up their migraines with them. So what we've seen in our, our clinical studies, and that has gone through and translated into what we're seeing now that our product is on the market, is that when people take this medication, they can take it at home uh, with our nasal spray device without uh, any trouble and, and get it reproducibly into their body, uh, know that it's in there, get very rapid onset. And then we see that people have coverage over their migraine for you know two days, uh, which for a lot of these people is, is uh, a way that they can take back that time in their lives, not worry about having to uh, take more medication on top of it and not worry about ending up in the emergency room with a very severe migraine. And so I think we're, we're very proud of that profile and seeing that translate from our phase three studies into the commercialization and with patients and physician uh, is really, really fulfilling to see that with the product. That's great, John. So John, wh what was the onset of action seen? Uh, we saw the, the earliest time point that we looked at was 15 minutes and we, we saw pain relief in, in patients within 15 minutes of administration. And that's one of the advantages of a nasal spray versus an oral pill. Our, the, our medication does not work as an oral pill at all. Um, but with the nasal cavity, you can get an onset and, uh, reproducibility and levels that are more similar to an injection. Uh, but again, people can do it easily at home by themselves and not have to, you know, weigh down the healthcare system by heading to the emergency room. And the effect lasts up to 48 hours? Yeah, that's right. And then they can redose at that point if, if necessary? Yeah, yeah. And they, they could redose if, if they needed to uh, before that 48 hour period, but um, the drug has a very long half-life. And so once it's administered, uh, yeah, it tends to stay in the body for a long period of time. Very interesting. Thank you so much, John. Yeah. Okay, Cynthia, same question for you. Um, is there a measurable impact you can cite on clinical outcomes for patients with, with your product? And what's been the clinician and patient response to your product so far? Thank you for the question, Kathy. I think first, you know, you have to just understand dialysis. Um, patients who have kidney disease at times progress um, to their kidneys no longer working, and then they need this life-saving treatment of going on dialysis. I think a lot of people don't understand that dialysis is not a restorative process. It doesn't make you feel better, doesn't improve your health. It's merely a stopgap um, for you not to die in order for you to move on to a different, um, you know, option like transplant. And so dialysis itself is a really difficult thing for patients to undergo. They typically will drive to a center or a hospital where they receive their treatment three to four times a week for three to four hours. Um, it's costly, it's tiring. And I think when you look at the dialysis market, it hasn't changed in over 30 years. And so I think it was the perfect time for someone to come in and, you know, outsets motto is better begins now. And so with Tableau, it is this all in one dialysis device that when it got approval for also home use in 2020, it was the first time in over 10 years 
that a product had been introduced into that space. And so just a little bit about Tableau, it's, you know, 35 inch box. Um, I don't know if you guys remember your, you know, college refrigerator. So it's not intimidating for patients. Um, it's connected, it's intelligent. Um, it has two way um, communication with the cloud. It allows um, documentation for healthcare professionals, um, system management for them. Uh, it has a touch screen, much like, you know, a smartphone or other devices that consumers use. So it has that familiarity because when you reach um, renal failure, you know, it's difficult. So being vulnerable and being in that space, you have a lot of things coming at you. I think that consumer usability um, is a phenomenal aspect of the product. Uh, making it easy to learn um, and operate. And really all you need is tap water, uh, an electrical outlet and a drain. And, um, you know, patients can receive dialysis on the machine in an ICU setting in the hospital, in a regular uh, dialysis clinic, and now all the way into um, their home where they can feel more comfortable. Um, so that being said, when I look at the data coming out of you know, patients using the machine, we have this home registry where large number of patients are having their data collected and we're looking at patient outcomes. Um, we do know in the kidney field that home dialysis gives you the best outcome. So longevity, health, your ability to participate in life. And what we're seeing is that these patients have over 100% retention using this device. I mean, you know, it's not easy to bring a complex medical device into your home um, and be successful at it. Um, we're also seeing that 98% of the treatments are successful. So not only are patients feeling comfortable, they're also improving their health on the device. Um, but when I look at, you know, people like myself, clinicians, nurses, you know, we did a study recently, you know, speaking to 200 clinicians and, you know, over 77% of them said that they would look at home dialysis in a different way because of this device. Um, just a little bit about it, you know, over half a million people in this country need dialysis and yet only 3% of those people are home on dialysis. Um, because it's really complicated. I mean, you're literally taking the blood out of your body and, and you can see it. And so, um, you know, this device is breaking down barriers so that large segments of the population that never would have been thought to be successful on a home modality uh, can achieve that. Um, we're seeing that out of a large organization using the device in California. They are, um, you know, publishing about very diverse backgrounds, different SES classes being able to dialyze and be successful and improve their health outcomes. Um, a more recent study that we did um, for the FDA looked at error, right? So you make a device and you know how you want it to be used, but how does the patient use it? And when we looked at those error rates for patients, um, they were incredibly tiny. And for, you know, nurses and physicians, the touch screen of the device really helped walk them through it so that um, medical errors could be decreased or infection rates and accidents that do happen in the hospital, especially with, you know, capacity being at its limit and staffing shortages. Um, so really, when you look across all sectors, you're seeing that impact. I think a final thing that spoke volume was that the height of the pandemic, um, you know, we had uh, the government have a contract with us uh, and the Tableau device was their lead machine they used for disaster preparedness and recovery. Um, when really that was a point that had never, you know, we've never faced before as a healthcare community. So those are some of the things that I really um, feel encouraged by with the product. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah, I could imagine the timing was perfect during the pandemic. I'm sure it was difficult for patients to go out or to have caregivers take them. So being able to do it at home must have been huge. I'm sure that increased compliance rates tremendously. So that, that's great. Great stuff. Thank you. Okay, Adam. So we have a different question for you. Um, what challenges did your company experience in transitioning from early proof of concept 
uh, to human testing, to ultimately uh, market authorization, and um, any lessons that you can share from your experience that might add to a better public understanding, awareness of the med tech innovation process. Sure, thanks, Kathy. Yeah, so a little bit of background on the technology I'll be talking about. So it's the Titan SGS platform, which is a sur surgical stapling device. Um, we're focused in weight loss procedures, so specifically sleeve gastrectomy. So you Gastrectomy procedure involves removing about 80% of the patient's stomach. Um, it was once thought to be purely a restrictive procedure, but we also know at this point it has a lot of metabolic effects, uh, which is why it's become the most popular surgical solution to treat uh, obesity today. Um, so what kind of contrasts our technology versus the existing technology is the existing technology um, is not procedure specific. So it's general purpose surgical staplers it takes about four to six firings to transect the entire length of the stomach. Um, the FDA actually recently came out with a guidance document suggesting that overlapping staple lines from repeated firings and, and procedures like sleep gastrectomy can re lead to an increased incidence of post-operative leaks. Um, so our device is the first of its kind indicated specifically for sleep gastrectomy. Um, the device itself is a 23 centimeter long stapler. Um, that can transect the entire stomach in one firing. And it also has technology in it that addresses the variation in tissue thickness um, that's present in the stomach. So one end of your stomach where you're stapling is a different compressibility and thickness than the other end. So we had to match the technology to the anatomy. Um, our technology eliminates that overlapping of staple lines and ultimately, our goal is to provide more consistent, repeatable outcome for the surgeon, which then impacts the patient and improves the post-operative outcomes for the patient. To date, we launched in um, August of 2021. We've completed 5,000 cases with the technology. Um, so to go back to your question, Kathy, the challenges that the company experienced um, from going to early development through ultimately um, market authorization Kind of there's there's a lot of different buckets for that. Um, you know, we were founded in 2014. We're a startup company, um, and so along the way, we faced a lot of challenges just from a funding perspective. Um, obviously, you have to show data. So our strategy was actually developing two products prior to the the technology we're talking about today. Um, so one was a reusable clamp device to prove the concept of what we were trying to do, um, and then a disposable version of that technology to get more more clinical feedback and wider adoption of the approach. Um, another challenge was us just technically. So a lot of um, not only investors, but colleagues um, that we talked to said, you know, if it could have been, if it can be done, somebody would have done it a long time ago. Um, so breaking down that thought process of, you know, what we're doing and the way we're approaching the problem is significantly different um, than the existing stapling technologies on the market, um, you know, our device is four times longer than any other endoscopic stapler on the market. So to manage the loads and reliably um, deliver staples for the surgeon uh, was a pretty, pretty difficult task. Um, and then the other piece of that is supply chain. So um, establishing relationships with very specialized uh, suppliers as a startup can be difficult at times um, because you're asking for them to go on a journey with you. Um, so it takes building relationships with those suppliers um, and, 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 creating a belief in what you're doing. Um, and then ultimately, you know, from a regulatory perspective, it was not an easy road as well. So um, as far as I'm aware, we're the only stapler that required a clinical study for, um, for FDA approval or clearance rather. And so, and then in the midst of the pandemic, we completed an ID, IDE study um, to support our second 510K submission, which was also ultimately when we were approved and cleared. So from a lessons perspective, the second part of your question, um, you know, I think one of the things we're really proud of here is our, our company was founded by a practicing bariatric surgeon. Um, and we partner with clinicians on a daily basis to make sure that we're not losing sight of the unmet needs that we think we're delivering on. Um, and that comes into the form of usability studies, um, just general, you know, user preference evaluations as well. Um, and then again, we, we develop products along the way um, to essentially prove the concept. So we launched two FDA cleared devices to just validate the hypothesis of the final product, which is the Titan SGS technology. Um, and then, you know, the one thing, you know, from a technology innovation process uh, that became apparent is, 
even if you have reimbursement and there's a clinical and economic data to support your technology, getting into the hospital and driving adoption is also very difficult. And so we leverage, um, since we're the only stapler in the market with sleep gastrectomy indications, um, we fall under new technology carve out clause, which helps us um, get wider adoption with surgeons and helps get through the approval process in their hospitals. Great, thank you, Adam. So Adam, how was the uh, the learning curve for the surgeons with, his, with your new product? So the interesting thing I mentioned, we, we, we launched two different clamp products to help drive, you know, validate the hypothesis, the approach we were taking, because it is kind of a new procedure. Uh, it's a new take on an existing procedure, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, and so the learning curve with those initial products was actually much steeper um, than the final product. And I think the value that we learned is that we learned a lot with those initial products, which were not as capital intensive to develop. Um, so, you know, we think of our Titan SGS uh, stapling technology as almost the third iteration, um, even though it's the initial offering in the market, because we learned so much from those two previous products. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so um, at this point, we can open it up to some um, answers or to answer some questions from the audience. I don't think I see any questions in the chat. Uh, while we wait for some questions to show up in the chat, I do have some questions that I can ask of each of you. And um, so basically, I thought this was a fun question. So what kind of device and diagnostic innovations might the Galleon Awards Committee be reviewing in your field five years from now? So we can start with you, Rob. Scott? Perfect. Um, so one of the interesting thing about the space of intraocular lenses is that we actually do have a kind of holy grail um, that we've been, been chasing. So, you know, I, I, I talked already about the, the innovation of, of Vividi and, and really the level of innovation that goes into new optical designs to really try to create the situation where patients have high quality vision um, at all distances under all, all, all conditions. And, and those are fundamentally um, static optics. So, so we're putting a static optical element into the eye. Um, if um, in, in anyone knows about the way the eye naturally works, um, especially earlier in life, um, there, there's actually a dynamic process called accommodation. So, so the reason in our youth um, we can see at distance, we can see it near, we can see everywhere in between is that the, um, there is an anatomically driven mechanism in our eyes that actually allows the lens to change power um, according to our visual intent. So that, that is where we're trying to go with intraocular lenses. So, so, so again, the, the outcomes are really good with today presbyopia correcting um, IOLs, but, but I think there's um, it, there's room to do even better by getting to this more biomimetic uh, approach that, that leverages what the eye wants to do naturally. So, so that's um, one thing. If, if I think a little bit more broadly about the intersection of technology with the maximization of benefit in our space and the minimization of risk in our space, and, and that's the, the name of the game we're, we're playing. Um, some of the other things that are really exciting and, and really starting to emerge include um, the use of artificial intelligence and, and machine learning, specifically in the domain of IOLs, um, to actually build and power algorithms that take all of the preoperative data, take all the post-operative data in terms of outcomes, and use that to drive outcomes that are getting better and better um, as we go. And, and improved diagnostic play into that as well by feeding in uh, better and better preoperative and postoperative data. I think another theme, and this really ladders up to the kind of minimization of risk that I mentioned, is the use of non-invasive uh, therapies. If I tie that back to um, intraocular lenses, um, that the refractive outcome isn't always perfect, perfect when an intra intraocular lens is implanted. And, and, and I think in the future, we will see non-invasive approaches whereby a surgeon can go in post-surgically and actually optimize and fine tune the distance power um, of the lens without making any incision using a laser or something something like that. Um, th this, this theme, I think, is also playing out in other ophthalmic spaces, in including glaucoma surgery, for example. And, and then the, the very last one that, that I would touch on, um, and, and I think here maybe I wouldn't say that ophthalmology is behind, but, but I, I'm thinking of the area of robotics. Um, and we do see some rather narrow deployment of, uh, of robotics in ophthalmology today. I, I think that's a harbinger of things to come. And, and I think that's another area where we'll see more and more innovation in the future um, in ophthalmology. Great. So Rob, if you were to put a guess out there in terms of when we could see non-invasive laser type adjustments, 
Would that be three years, four years? Yeah, I mean, I, as you can imagine, I'm going to hesitate to put a, a, a exact <laughs> number on it. But but what, what I can say is that, you know, there are a number of promising uh, te technical uh, approaches. Um, and, and as I said before, I, I think it's inevitable that we will get there. Awesome. Thank you so much. OK, Rob Kissling, uh, same question. So what kind of device and diagnostic innovations might the Galleon Awards Committee be reviewing in your field five years from now? I think that's tougher to answer. I, I think, uh, especially as it pertains to diagnostics, I guess I'll, I'll take that approach. Um, th so the, the holy grail clinically of diagnostics is does it alter your management? And so what it means is in predicting that, um, which therapeutics are going to become the most significant over the next five years? And, and will one drive the other? I, I agree with my, my colleague previously. I think data is important. It's collection, it's processing, it's interpretation. But I think in the end, whether it's diagnostic or new device, it boils down to and what does it enable? What does it enable a clinician to do now that he or she couldn't do before? And and I think I I think uh, I think data will certainly be important there. I think one unique area of the eye is imaging. It's a, it's an area of the eye where you it, it many things that are invisible in other parts of the body are visible because of the nature of the eye. So I think uh, imaging is also going to be very important. But again, it's going to be in that question of what, it, what does it allow me to treat? What does it allow me to do for a patient that I can't already do? Uh, also powerful is genetic screening. And, and again, I think there are currently limitations on that. There's, there's limitations to how well can you actually manipulate the genome, uh, the condition itself, even if you understand the system. Um, and, and so I think these these things will all be unfolding in the next few years. And and some of those, I think it may go beyond the, the five years you're describing. Um, but but certainly, um, certainly genetics, uh, you know, is a burgeoning field imaging. Um, but again, it all ties back to that. What does it allow me to do that I can't currently do? And does this diagnostic test alter what I'm going to do? Not just for curiosity's sake. Right. Right. Excellent. Thank you, Rob. John, how about you? What kind of device and diagnostic innovations might the Galen Awards Committee be reviewing in your field five years from now? Yeah. So my field in general, I would, I would say, is uh, probably nasal and respiratory drug delivery. And I think that um, one of the areas where hopefully we see an expansion of that and, and more usage is in some of the novel therapeutics that are being developed. Um, most of the, the work going on right now in, in academia, in pharmaceutical uh, companies is, is focused on uh, biologic uh, drugs. So things like um, oligonucleotides and mRNA therapies. And there's a lot of potential and a lot of promise in these therapies. Um, but one of the big issues uh, in, in getting these to function properly is administering them so that they can actually get to the site of action and uh, work as they're intended to. And, and almost any biologic drug out there, you're unable to deliver it uh, orally. The, the normal way we take drugs through a pill uh, just doesn't you know, absorb through the stomach in the right way. It gets dissolved and, and falls apart. So I think that as these types of therapies advance, we will see more utilization of, of respiratory routes, of local routes of administration uh, that can work uh, in, in conjunction with or to uh, work in place of injections, which, uh, you know, injections are great. They work really well, but there's a lot of cases where they're suboptimal, uh, especially self-administration. Or a good example is um, in uh in countries outside of the US, Europe and Japan, where access to, you know, sterile needles, healthcare uh, administrators, uh, hospital settings, these are things that we take for granted, but are not available in a lot of countries around the world. And so I think that uh, as we're looking at even the big one, like uh, COVID vaccines moving forward, uh, nasal administration of those uh, to do that in a reproducible way um, in countries where you don't need cold chain and, uh, you know, nursing and, and uh, medical staff uh, to be able to administer these uh, much more easily and readily and uh, hopefully cheaply, uh, I think would be a, 
a major innovation related to my field. And I, I'm hoping in the next five years we see more widespread use of that technology uh, throughout the world, hopefully uh, tackle some of these viruses before they, they break out too, too largely. Thank you, John. I'm also thinking, you know, it seems that now we have so many more people who are experiencing neurological disorders, um, whether it's MS or stroke or other things which can affect swallowing. So yeah. for people who have difficulty swallowing, this could be another option for them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think that uh, neuroscience in particular is starting to see a lot more innovation on the uh, pharmacological side with with new therapies. And so, you know, hopefully uh, local administration or nasal administration could be a part of those therapies as well. Great. Thank you. OK, uh, Cynthia, same question for you. What kind of device and diagnostic innovations might the Galleon Awards Committee be reviewing in your field five years from now? So I think as a true Alex Setter, I am going to approach this from a disruptive dreamer perspective. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, for me, I think healthcare is at a crossroads right now uh, and looking towards the future. We really have an opportunity um, for the system as a whole and um, the kidney space in particular. You know, the COVID-19 pandemic exposed opportunities to connect with patients and families in the home setting in the way we never had a chance to before. And home therapies and modalities is really, I think, where healthcare um, is moving. Um, you know, we were able to see the challenges they face, their burdens, um, and these are all the things that keep people from excelling and meeting their healthcare goals. I can, you know, foresee a technology for dialysis that would allow immersive simulation um, and augmented reality for home dialysis training um, that would remove these barriers and knock down health disparities across large segments of our population, um, even multi-language support or um, multi-educational tools for non-traditional learners, such as people with sight impairment, hearing impairment, um, you know, an innovation that would allow any single person on this entire planet to be able um, to be transferred to their home and dialyze there when they're suffering from kidney failure. Uh, I think that type of innovation would be exciting for me to witness, you know, doing something like that would allow researchers and clinicians to be able to really understand kidney disease processes more biologically uh, and less impacted by access to care and other social determinants. Um, you know, allowing people around the globe to dialyze at home, um, irrespective of their resources or lack of resources, I think that is, is something we should innovate towards. I agree. Thank you so much. It's, it's really a burden. If you don't have someone, it, you know, a caretaker, a caregiver, a champion to help you, to take you to the sites to get, you know, your, your therapy, it's very difficult. So, or someone, yeah. or someone who doesn't speak your language, or someone who you know their education might be more primary education and not a higher level. You know, it always amazes me. Patients know how to use their um, smartphone no matter what. So that type of technology really broke down significant barriers. Yep. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay, Adam, same question. Uh, what kind of device or diagnostic innovations might the Galleon Awards Committee be reviewing in your field five years from now? Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that the goal in, in you know obesity is really treat the disease state, right? So right now in the in the field we're in, in, in surgical intervention within obesity, only 1% of at least the US population pursue surgery as a treatment pathway. Um, so, you know, I'd be looking for a technology that's Kind of changing the perception of the treatment pathway and showing the same effects or similar effects that we see with surgery day um and you know i don't i don't know if that's in the form of a you know a pharma solution or or some other solution but that's ultimately our goal and you know you know while that's happening and, and emerging you know we're continuing to develop technologies to make it easier for surgeons and 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 
improve the safety profile of the surgery um, with the goal that more patients will um, get treatment for obesity, which can lead to so many other comorbidities um, along with, with it. Thank you, Adam. Okay, so I still don't see any questions in our chat. Don't be shy, everyone. Go ahead and ask questions. We have them live here. Okay, well, while we're waiting, I'll ask one more question. So, um, and John, I'll start with you. Uh, what what new areas of science excite you the most? Um, I think it, in in general, I, I would say some of the, as I mentioned, some of the new therapeutic uh, modalities that are, are coming to light. I, I think there's been a, a huge focus, obviously, historically on, on small molecule medications and just the standard, you know, finding a, a key for the lock um, approach to drug development. But uh, some of the, the new innovations in, in looking at uh, new types of targets or, you know, changing um, uh, changing things like gene editing or uh, changing protein production within the body. Uh, those things are, are really exciting uh, to me and to, I think, a lot of other people because they, they represent a whole, a whole uh, sea of, of new targets potentially and, and a new way to look at some of these uh, disease states uh, that have, you know, run, on, run into the wall in terms of development because of a lack of knowledge about the specific receptors that are going to affect the disease or because of just really a lack of small molecule targets, uh, traditional drug targets that could uh, uh, could um, influence these diseases. Um, and then specifically, I've worked in central nervous system drug development for my career. And so uh, I'm really, really hopeful that as we start to learn more about um, some of these huge looming diseases like dementia, um, Alzheimer's is a subset of those that we can use some of these new technologies to, to truly address them because they are, as we're living longer and we're having an older population, they really are going to be a huge uh, societal burden and also just devastating for families. So um, I'm, I'm really excited about that and really crossing my fingers that some, some, good basic science gets done that can translate into uh, therapies for those, those CNS disorders. I agree. It would be great if we could do some gene editing for dementia. Yeah. Okay. Rob Kissing, how about you? Uh, Kissling, I'm sorry. Um, what, what are some of the new areas of science that excite you the most? Yeah, the one that came to mind first is something even outside of my, my own current uh, eye care study, but it's certainly the microbiome. I think um, even from my from my own clinical career, where we were more or less taught that that microbes are around, many some of them are harmful, the others are co-inhabitants. But I think we're just on the precipice of understanding just how influential those microbes are. Uh, I think we don't yet know it well enough to manipulate it to our own therapeutic end. But but I think that's an incredibly exciting area of science. For a long time, people thought microbiology was a dead science. We've mastered the microbe, so to speak. But it turns out we haven't scratched the surface at all, practically. Agreed. Thank you, Rob. Cynthia, how about you? What, what are some of the new areas of science that excite you the most? Um, so I, I would say the number one, now I hope my chief financial officer isn't watching because they're going to be in so much trouble, but I would love everybody to get any organ that they need, right? So to be able to produce a kidney when you're reaching, you know, kidney failure, um, for anybody anywhere would just be, you know, the lack of a better clinical word, so cool and amazing for us to, to reach that state as a, as a healthcare community. Um, and that would obviously crush my company, but <laughs> so, so, you know, that's just amazingly interesting for me in terms of nephrology as a whole, I think, you know, computer generated learning, virtual reality simulation, that way you're bringing, um, like you said, you can bring caregivers from across the globe to a, a meeting site and teach them things. Um, and, um, help them understand the disease that they might be suffering from in a better way. You'd have more 
cultural context into it. I mean, how many times do a lot of our areas in healthcare remain stagnant because we haven't found ways to innovate to the populations that that we're treating, you know, some being more difficult than others to to penetrate that market into. Um, So really using technology um, to break down training into a matter of, you know, imagine you just trained a single hour and you could use a a high grade medical technology and anybody could that that would be really exciting, I think. Absolutely. Thank you. Rob Scott, how about you? What new areas of science excite you the most? Yeah, this is a hard one to go um, last on, but maybe uh, building on um, a couple of the the other thoughts. Um, I, I, I was thinking about cell based um, therapies, so, you know. So, so I gave the example, and I'm I'm thinking more broadly than IOLs at, at this point. But I gave the example earlier about how if we look forward to um, devices which mimic the natural accommodative mechanism of, of the eye, I, I think that the next step behind that that kind of thinking is is where can we use cell based therapies um, either to um, you know build a, a device in the eye that that does you know e- even more and even better than than what the the historical device has done, or I I think even more excitingly just to start to think about where we can use cell-based therapy to solve problems that we've actually not been able to solve or address um, so so far um, with uh, quote unquote traditional devices. Great, thank you, Rob. And Adam, I don't think I asked you this question, did I? No, you didn't. Okay, yeah. so yeah. what are the new areas that excite you the most? Yeah, I have to agree with, with Rob. I mean, the gut microbiome is a really interesting and exciting area um, to see where it takes us. Um, and, you know, uh, several years ago, I was doing research in that field, and it, it was kind of just amazing to me uh, what, what they're finding out and, and continue to find out. Um, within the surgical device space, um, you know, obviously, robotic surgery is growing. And with that, you know, the emergence of technology with AI, and that was mentioned earlier as well. Um, it'll be really interesting to see where the, where the future takes us. Thank you. And we do have a few more minutes. So I'm going to open it up to everyone on the panel. If you want to just have some closing remarks. Rob Scott, do you, would you like to start with any closing remarks? Um, no, I just, um, you know, th- thanks for the opportunity to um, be on the panel, be part of the discussion. Uh, w- was really happy to present the uh, Vividi um, te- technology, and I, I think the-, the role that that innovation plays in extending the reach of presbyopia correcting IOLs, um, and-, and also really happy to ha- kind of you know, be able to present that in the context of these other um, innovations. So, so appreciate it. Thank you, Rob. Rob Kissling, how about you? Would you like to say any final words? Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, this is really my first involvement with this group. And, and what I would say is it's, it's really important. It, it provides a really important outlet in terms of um, uh, putting milestones down, uh, understanding where we've been and where we're going. Um, and, and I think in science, we, we tend not to. We always think about what is the next thing? What is the next thing? What is the next thing? And advancement can occur so slowly, you almost don't understand that it's happening sometimes, unless it's really dramatic. And, and not everything is the invention of penicillin. And sometimes, as I mentioned, it's, it's stepwise. And I think it's important for, for times like this just to stop and acknowledge some of those smaller stepwise innovations. I agree. Thank you, Rob. Don, how about you? Do you have any closing remarks? Um, yeah, also my my first uh, involvement with the organization or, or this this nomination with the Galen Foundation. It's a it's a very impressive um, group of people. I'm very honored to be uh, amongst them. And it, it is, I think, really important to uh, have this type of event to to shed light on on uh, advances in in these fields. I, I think there was a, a bit more, hopefully, uh, awareness in the general public of, you know, health innovations over the past three years. Uh, but still, it is one of those things that um, can go a, a little bit unseen and unappreciated. And, and a lot of the things in, especially in uh, the United States that feed into that innovation um, can go unappreciated. Uh, and so this is, I think, a really, really amazing event. I'm very you know, proud to be a part of. So thank, thank you. you John. Thank you. Cynthia, how about you? Any closing remarks? Yeah, thank you, Kathy. I, you know, I want to 
thank you for moderating and thank you to the the Alien committee um, for having us. It's it's an honor. I think um, like my fellow panelists here, I um, am so appreciative that the Pre Galleon Foundation chose to look at areas in healthcare that aren't sensationalized. You don't see it, you know, um, on the news or talked about or a storyline on, you know, one of a soap opera that we watch or something like that, right? People aren't talking about the, th you know, nasal delivery. They're not really making that cool and sexy and exciting. And so it's really humbling um, and really um, genius to look at these areas that are becoming underserved just because they're not brought to the forefront, but they clearly are quite impactful and um, service many, many people who suffer from these diseases. Um, and so I'm just very appreciative to be part of this amazing group. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. I'm sorry, Cynthia. <laughs> okay, Adam, why don't you take us home here? All right, well, I, go, I always go last, so I, you know, I just echo <laughs> everyone's sentiments. Um, no, I, this first time being involved with the organization, uh, it's been an awesome experience so far. I appreciate the opportunity to tell everyone a little bit about the technology we've been working on um, for the last several years and uh, look forward to the future innovations that come. Great, thank you. And I'm sorry that you always were asked last. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you again to our panelists for sharing your product innovations in the med tech field. And thank you also for all the hard work that you and your teams have done to get to this place. Um, it does not go unrecognized. I know there was probably a lot of hours and a lot of time away from your family and your loved ones. So thank you very much for all the hard work. And thank you for our, our audience today for joining us. Um, this webcast can be accessed on the Galleon Foundation's homepage. Um, and just a reminder that this Thursday is the Golden Jubilee Forum, and it begins at 7.30 a.m. And it will be featuring a group CEO keynoter, followed by the presentation of the 2022 Roy Vagalos Pro Bono Humanum Award winner at 6.30 p.m. And immediately thereafter, the Pre-Galleon Awards Dinner. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us and have a great day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.